All right, uh, well, thank you for coming, and it's uh, a terrific honor to be recognized by an award that's named after someone who made such a uh, far-reaching and, um, I think, long-term contribution and impact in the uh, intersection between computers and molecular biology. And um, I hope um, some of the things that I tell you about today will um, basically connect to the idea that there are rich uh, discoveries and advances to be made wherever uh, computers can be applied to problems in um, biochemistry and molecular biology. So what I'll tell you about uh, today is uh, a little bit about the work that we've been done, doing in the laboratory on protein assemblies. Our interest in um, protein assemblies span um, natural systems that I'll tell you just a tiny bit about. They also cover protein crystals, which are really the ultimate protein assembly. Uh, but most of my talk uh, will be dedicated to some exciting uh, recent work on uh, redesigning protein molecules to make them uh, self-assemble into sophisticated structures uh, motivated by natural systems. So I'll tell you just a little bit about um, some of the work that we're doing on the biological side, um, partly just as an advertisement uh, for um, some really uh, cool systems. These are systems that I'm... Uh, a chagrin to say that I think are still widely uh, not appreciated. It turns out that in probably about 20% of all bacteria under certain growth conditions, uh, the bacterium will produce giant protein capsids that look exactly like viruses, but in fact they're not viruses. They're essentially protein-based metabolic organelles that the bacteria use to encapsulate a series of uh, sequentially acting enzymes for the express purpose of carrying out a metabolic reaction in an enclosed space uh, protected from the cytosol. So I don't have time to say a lot about these, just two slides. Uh, the founding member is called the carboxysome. It encapsulates Rubisco and car uh, carbonic anhydrase all through the oceans, cyanobacteria where they fix CO2. That's all being done inside a protein box. We uh, stumbled on these systems about 10 years ago and decided they'd be ripe for trying to figure out how they operated, and so we started doing the structural biology on these. And just in a nutshell, um, it turns out that the shell proteins make these hexagonal units, which almost fill space, but they have a narrow hole down the middle, which turns out to be the route by which substrates and products have to get in and out of these metabolic chambers. And then those further assemble to make layers, and those close up to make shells. and so. Um, we know a lot more now than we did before about how these operate, and this is just a gallery of uh, some crystal structures of different shell proteins in different systems. Uh, each of the shells is composed, in fact, not of one type of shell protein, but of several paralogs, and so each of the paralogs has different functions in binding enzymes or allowing things to come in and out. So this is just a gallery of some structures, and one instance of a, uh, a special insight that was obtained by one crystal, two crystal structures, of the same protein showing that in fact it can undergo a gating transformation to allow uh, large things like probably cofactors to come in and out of these systems. So this is um, a, sort of a rich area for further investigation uh, for young people looking for an area that's underexplored. I offer this as an advertisement, but for the purpose of um, this talk, these systems that we work on serve as a motivation for um, a lot of things, but also for, uh, in particular for protein design. So I'll just make a few points here, and that is that the sophisticated protein assemblies that you find in nature serve as motivations for uh, trying to build things in order to understand them, and that sort of follows what Feynman said, what I cannot create, I do not understand, and so that motivates efforts to try and build things like this. The fact that nature has used proteins in so many different ways to build all kinds of interesting structures is basically proof that proteins can be uh, repurposed to do really interesting things. And so that means uh, designing proteins offers um, uh, the opportunity to make all kinds of interesting things. So I won't say much about the prospective um, sort of applications for the kinds of things I'll tell you about in a minute, but I think essentially um, uh, imagination is the limit. The last couple of decades of uh, focus on DNA-based nanotechnology, beginning with work that Ned Seaman started, and it's been possible with DNA molecules to make smiley faces and boxes that open and close. And so we're sort of uh, a decade or so behind that, but nature chose proteins for a lot of uh, high functionality uh, applications. And so I think there's good reasons to believe that proteins uh, ultimately will be able to, to do that by design. So in addition to these two points, uh, 
looking at natural structures actually gives you important clues about how you should go about trying to design your own proteins to make such structures. And the vital clue in our view is symmetry. And so I'll spend the next couple of slides telling you a little bit about uh, symmetry. So first, the meaning of symmetry, something that's symmetric usually means that it's composed of multiple copies of the same subunit or the same component arranged in a particular way and in particular arranged so that the different units have the same environments, so that they're essentially indistinguishable from each other. The reason that um, you see things like this pattern in nature was appreciated at least 60 years ago by Crick and Watson in their early studies, uh, which were prophetic, uh, trying to guess what uh, viral capsids would end up looking like, where they basically reasoned that symmetric assemblies are, is what you would find in nature, and that's in fact the case, and they expected that would be the case because for symmetric assemblies, what you end up having is a minimum number of distinct interaction types that are required to hold the assembly together. So that idea uh, is an old one. So I'll tell you now a little bit about sort of ideas about uh, symmetric assemblies and the number of ways the molecules have to touch each other in order for them to constitute a connected uh, object. So here's the simplest case, and this is basically illustrates the possible outcomes that you can have in a system where a molecule only has one interface. It only touches itself one distinct way. And what you can see here is there's really just sort of two outcomes. One is you can have a head-to-tail arrangement. This contact is the same as that one, and you can just get a linear filament. Um, another possibility is that the connection between the things is not straight but bent, and then you can get rings of subunits. But there are no other possibilities for forming architectures with a subunit that only touches itself one way. That's basically as far as you can go. And you can basically uh, understand why that's the case by a little bit of group theory. So anything that's symmetric can be described by its symmetry group, which is a collection of all the operations that you can do to the whole assembly that don't leave it, that leave it unchanged. And so as an example, here's this cyclic ring with six subunits. The symmetry operations of it are 0 degrees, 60 degrees, 120, 180, 240, 300. That group is called cyclic because you can take one element out of that group, 60 degrees, and if you multiply it by itself over and over, you get all the other elements. So these sorts of arrangements are simple and they can be made with one contact type because their groups can be generated by one element. So what if you want to make something more sophisticated like the things you see in nature? Well, that means you have to have a molecule which touches itself more than one way. And so what can you get if a molecule touches itself more than one way? So here I've drawn out two of many, many, many possibilities of architectures you can get with two contact types. So here's a ring of four molecules with one contact type. What you can see is it's sufficient Introducing a single additional contact type is actually sufficient to make a quite complicated structure here, 24 subunits in the shape of a cube. Here's the same four subunit arrangement here, and one extra contact with a different angle here will give an indefinite layer that goes forever in two dimensions. And there are many other possibilities. And so here's a sort of a complicated mathematical statement, but basically the summary is that if you understand the symmetry of an architecture that you're interested in, then you can work out how many different contact types have to be in the object in order to make it. And that idea has uh, basically propelled a lot of work in my laboratory in the last um, couple of decades. Uh, really work along two lines. I don't have time to tell you uh, in much detail about the first one. I'll just show you one slide. Uh, and that is that, as I said, protein crystals are really the ultimate assembly. And uh, both of our previous speakers alluded to the difficulty of growing protein crystals. And so all crystallographers are interested in of why it's so hard and how it might be made easier. Um, and so, of course, the molecules have to touch each other a certain number of ways to make a protein crystal. And just this one slide summarizes a, a very old paper that uh, I think is, whose influence continues to grow. And that is that, uh, skipping all the underlying details, with this idea of the minimum number of contacts required to make assemblies, what we uh, basically worked out uh, 20 years ago was an answer to a long-standing puzzle about why certain arrangements are so much more commonly found in protein crystals compared to others. And basically the surprise from the analysis was not just that we could explain why things are the way they are, 
But an extension of the idea uh, from a long time ago was a prediction that if you could make molecules, biological molecules, in both hands so that you had a racemic mixture, the theory we worked out predicted that your chances of growing crystals would be much, much higher than trying to grow them from the biological hand. Now, until we have a left-handed E. coli from which we can purify left-handed ribosomes and left-handed pre-initiation complexes, it remains a problem, but for the regime where you can make uh, peptides or nucleic acids, basically this is the answer. If you can make it in both hands, your, your problems are much, much smaller. So anyway, that's just one slide that uh, basically came from uh, uh, an, uh, an idea that came from this contact number work. And so what I'll tell you about now is basically sort of the, the rest of the talk is how it's led us to ideas for how you can take protein molecules and design them so they'll self-assemble into sophisticated structures. So based on what I uh, told you, I think you can see the problem now reduces to, to sort of two problems, and that is if there's a particular kind of architecture you want to build, what you have to know is how many different contact types are required for that architecture, and it turns out to be a sort of a group theory problem. And then the second part is, of, is of course, once I know how many contact types and I know the geometry, how do I put those in a protein molecule if they weren't there before? So I'll tell you uh, brief answers to those. So it turns out, uh, it was surprising to us that many, many sophisticated and seemingly complex architectures can be realized with only two distinct contact types. Now, you can build a structure of a given type with more than the minimum required contact types, but you can't build it with fewer. So it turns out that many architectures can be built with two contact types, and I'm showing you two examples here. These are similar to ones I showed you. Here's one object which has two contact types. This is meant to illustrate a 180 degrees or dimeric interface. This is meant to illustrate a 120 degree interface. That object with two interfaces, if the geometry is correct, will form a 24 subunit cube. Here's a two-dimensional arrangement where there's two contact types that give a layer, and many, many other possibilities uh, can be created. So we came to this realization uh, some time ago, and then we asked ourselves, well, if you want to build something out of protein molecules, it means what you have to do is figure out how to make a protein molecule that has two interface types in it. And so how do you do that? Well, our work on this problem is quite old now, our, our sort of initial work, and so it predates by many years uh, the idea that you can take a protein molecule and build an interface into it by computational sequence design. So I'll tell you a little bit about that at the end of the talk, but when we began this, uh, the possibility didn't escape our attention. It just wasn't possible, and so we had to come up with a different idea for creating protein molecules that had particular interfaces in them. And so the way we did that was to say, well, there are many protein, proteins whose structures are known, which are already simple oligomers, dimers, and trimers are, are rich. And so the idea was that if you took a protein that was a dimer and a protein that was a trimer and you just created a fusion between the two, then if the two components fold up correctly, you've created a protein molecule that has two interface types. It's got the dimer side and the trimer side. And so that's sort of back to this idea. So, of course, the problem is if you connect two proteins as a fusion, even if you don't put a lot of uh, amino acids between them, there's still an uncertainty about where they've been joined. The phi psi angle is unknown, and so you're not going to get any particular outcome. And so how do you join two protein molecules in a way that they can be fused uh, together sensibly with the correct geometry? So the answer to that was uh, developed by Jennifer Padilla in the laboratory, and the idea was that when you do these fusions, the idea was to focus only on proteins which have alpha helical termini, with the idea that if you take a protein which ends in an alpha helix and you fuse it to a protein that begins in an alpha helix, and you get lucky, and any intervening residues you use are of an alpha helix preferring character, then you might be able to get a single protein molecule where the orientation between the two components is predictable, because you can just calculate on a computer, and each of the components then carries with it its natural interface. So that was Jennifer's idea. It was a bit of a wild stretch that this would work, but she executed it almost single-handedly. So it was really sort of an exercise in combinatorial chemistry, taking all the known, uh, for example, all the known dimers, all the known trimers with helical ends, 
patching them, them up, all the possible ways they can be patched up, putting short helical linkers between them, and then for all the possibilities, asking whether the orientation of the two components is correct. In other words, asking whether the symmetry elements that are carried by the two parts have the correct geometric dis disposition to build whatever the desired architecture was. Okay, so what, is the, what are the required rules? Well, it was uh, basically known to the Greeks, so if you take the platonic solids, you can work out what the angles are between all the possible symmetry axes, and you can work out which combinations of those, according to some group theory, give rise to the required architectures, and then you can just write those down as a list, and then you can go back to the combinatorial exercise and just ask, of all the known structures that I could create in this way, how many of them have the required geometry? And so Jennifer did this um, basically, gosh, 15 years ago. And so the database was much, much smaller than, than it is now, and there weren't a huge number of possibilities, but she found one that looked good, a fusion of a matrix protein from a virus and an enzyme, a trimeric protein. And when fused, the symmetry axes of those two components was supposed to intersect at about the required angle for making a 12 subunit a tetrahedral complex. And so she went and created that um, uh, assembly. And this is what it was supposed to make. This is just a model on the computer. And she expressed it in E. coli and purified it. And the result was it did, in fact, form what looked like geometric assemblies by electron microscopy. This is now quite old, type EM, negative stain. And what was clear was that among the things that looked like they were the right size were a field of other things that were incorrect. And light scattering showed that, in fact, it was quite polymorphic, and we were not able to crystallize it. And so we wrote this paper about this uh, really fascinating idea about combining symmetries together, but basically it didn't work very well. And so it didn't go very far, and it languished for a long time in the laboratory um, until a new student uh, joined the lab, Yen Ting Lai, and he shared my interest in uh, geometry. And so he went back to the drawing board, uh, and he took the original construct that Jennifer Padilla had made, and in the space of a couple of weeks, looking at it on the computer, he came to me and he said, well, I'm not sure this was designed that carefully. He said, there's a lysine residue in one of the domains that looks like it's pointing at one of the helices. And I said, well, it's a lysine, it'll get out of the way. And he said, no, I've looked at um, the Rotomer libraries. So when we did this work, it wasn't really established, you know, what the allowable side chains were for amino acids, but now all the possible configurations that are likely have been tabulated. And so with this new information in hand, he said, no, none of the allowable rotomers for lysine can fit here. And so we changed the lysine to an alanine, and he made one other amino acid change. And looking at native gels, what he found was that when he started making these changes, what was a smear turned into discrete bands and then into single bands and then into crystals and crystal structures. So after all this time, it really just took a little bit of more effort and a couple of amino acid changes to show that this idea actually worked. And here's a crystal structure of the 12 subunit cage. Looks like a tetrahedron, a little bit smashed because of the flexibility. Not so surprisingly, he went on to uh, get crystal structures of the same protein in many crystal forms that showed its flexibility. And this is just a morph to show that because of the flexibility that can be assumed by the different uh, things that are found in the different crystal structures, it shows us that, in fact, this assembly that he made, we intended it to be solid and rigid, but it, accidentally it looks like it's actually quite flexible. It wasn't intended, but it actually points to the a possibility in future work of trying to design assemblies that might have um, conformational switches and the ability to have conformational changes that would be promoted by, for example, ATP hydrolysis. So I'm just going quickly now uh, so through some of the recent successes. So Yen decided that it took so long for us to prove the first case, he better prove a second one before he left. So the first was a 12 subunit tetrahedron. He then chose two other proteins to make a cube. Uh, the angle of their intersection is narrower, and it was supposed to be 24 subunits. He made that protein, and again, it didn't crystallize, and so he went to a variety of other sort of experimental techniques with native ma uh, mass spectrometry with uh, Carol Robinson's lab. He actually proved that it was in fact a mixture not of only eight trimers, which would be 24 subunits, but it was uh, six trimers and four trimers, and he showed the same by EM and by 
um, Sachs analysis as well. But then he found after nine months or something, he did get crystals and a crystal structure. And it showed, I'm not showing the overlap here because the match between the design and the crystal structure is so close you can hardly tell them apart. It was only about one angstrom difference. So it turned out to be polymorphic, but the form that could be crystallized actually matched the crystal structure in exquisite detail. So that proves uh, basically that uh, with a little effort, um, this original idea of fusing oligomers works. But then something um, more powerful happened, and that was that uh, a student in my laboratory, Neil King, decided to leave and go somewhere where he could do something else. And so what he did was he went to David Baker's laboratory, and he said, well, this fusion stuff is limited, and I'm going to go to um, Baker's laboratory and use the Rosetta programs that are... Uh, now, with some success, can be used to design interfaces into protein molecules. And he's, this was basically the idea. This is what we had been doing, was fusing oligomers together and trying to get this geometry correct, natural interfaces, two natural interfaces. And Neil said, no, I'll go to uh, Baker's lab, and I'll take natural oligomers with one interface, and I'll use Rosetta to build in the second one. And so, sort of quickly summarizing Neil's uh, fabulous uh, results, his idea then would be to make a cube. He'd take eight copies of a trimer. He'd rotate each of the trimers in unison around the body diagonals and then jam them on the computer towards the center till they collided. When they'd collide, he'd calculate whether that looked like they made enough contacts to be useful for design. If so, then he would use Rosetta to strip the amino acids down to alanine and then redesign the sequence to make something that looked complementary. So Neil synthesized, I think, 92 or 94 genes uh, that uh, Rosetta said might work, and of those, two of them did. He sent those back down, and we did crystal structures of those and showed that, in fact, these match the designs within one or two angstroms also. So this is then a, a more powerful approach, uh, more difficult in some ways on the design side, but more powerful in the sense that um, you don't have to rely on fusion. In a paper that was published after that, Neil showed an, a variation on that where He'd take two components and basically al alternate them around the corners of a cube and essentially do the same thing. There, with some changes, they got the success rate up to about 10%, and they sent those proteins down, and we did the crystallography on those as well. So now there's sort of the second idea that's working. So this is, these are the uh, sort of a gallery of the published crystal structures of protein cages that have been designed sort of by scratch so far. Uh, this one and that one are the fusion methods we designed, and these are the ones that Neil and, and Jacob Bale and others in Baker's lab have done and that we've done the crystal structures of. One thing that um, I think is particularly interesting, at least to me, is, is the possibilities. So this is a table of the, the different symmetries that you might combine together to make all kinds of interesting things, and what's been explored so far is mainly just simple things like combining dimers, C2 dimers, and C3 trimers, to make materials, but much of the rest of the table is unexplored. In some work that's not published yet, but I hope to be sent off next week, um, Jacob Bale in Baker's laboratory has designed icosahedral structures, the largest possible assemblies possible in three dimensions, symmetry order 60, uh, of a whole variety of different types, and these are crystal structures we've determined of three of those, and those are sort of the largest uh, sort of things to date. Uh, I'll just with the last couple of slides, I'll take you back to the first thing I told you about, which was the bacterial microcompartments that are of interest to us on the biological side. Uh, those are these hexamer units I told you about. Well, we've been trying to redesign those proteins, and really by accident, through some circular permutation design work we did on one of these proteins, the redesign converted the hexamer to a pentamer unexpectedly. The proteins have a natural tendency to, as to uh, assemble side by side, and if you put pentamers side by side, you get an icosahedron. So we actually got an icosahedral crystal structure of proteins, which are naturally um, these shell proteins from the bacterial microcompartments. And so we're particularly excited about this because if we can build up simplified shells out of bacterial microcompartments, we'll have a system where we can actually study the molecular transport through the pores of these things by encapsulating molecules and showing their transport. So... I think I'm um, running low on time, and so I'll just sort of quickly summarize that what I've, I've shown you so far is basically uh, 
the idea of making cages, finite structures that obey the symmetries of the platonic solids, tetrahedra, octahedra, icosahedral structures, but you can actually make materials which are extended of indefinite, uh, unbounded extent in two and three dimensions with all kinds of different combinations. We've worked out maybe 100 different um, combinations. Here's one, a layer, where if you combine a D2 tetramer and a C2 dimer in the right way, you can get an, a layer like this. This is largely unexplored, but in recent work, uh, a little older work from uh, Martin Noble's laboratory in the UK, and then all three of these from Baker and Gonan's laboratory, um, they have some different symmetries they've made of uh, highly ordered uh, layers that extend over great extent. And uh, this will continue to explore the possibilities, and then that leaves sort of as the last frontier, building three-dimensional arrays, basically three-dimensional crystals out of protein molecules, and that's still wide open. So this is uh, basically the summary, and that is that uh, inspired largely by the way nature has designed protein molecules to make sophisticated structures, it's been possible to work out a few, at least a couple of different uh, somewhat discrete or distinct strategies for redesigning protein molecules to make really cool things out of them. Uh, other sort of things need to be explored, but the next area then will be to demonstrate applications for these, and here I think um, Basically, imagination is the limit. You can imagine synthetic vaccines with um, viral epitopes decorating the outside, or you can imagine delivery devices uh, where these cages carry things, or the extended materials being used as basically high-density display of uh, signaling motifs or of catalytic activities or any number of different things. So I think the future looks bright for um, protein design, and I'll end by thanking... Um, collaborators and people in my laboratory and yellow are, are people who made particularly important contributions to the, the design work. Yen, who rescued a, an idea which had sort of been a thorn for many years and uh, now turned went from sort of defeat to victory. And um, others in the laboratory, Dan, who did the crystallography on one of the systems and UC on the other. Uh, Neil, who was a student in my lab, but actually has done his fabulous work in um, David Baker's lab and their collaborators there. And then, of course, uh, I have to thank funding, and I'm particularly grateful to the um, Society for um, uh, the recognition that this award brings. So thank you so much.